Hello. The story I'm going to be reading is called The Littlest Angel. I'm reading this book because it was a Christmas story that I would always hear every Christmas as I was growing up. It's a story that would be read to us on Christmas Eve as we were putting up our Christmas tree and doing all the decorations. So it was a tradition in our house from for many, many years, and um, it has always it has stuck with me for as long as I can remember. And when I was asked to read a Christmas story, this is the definitely the one that I wanted to read. The story was written by a man named Charles Taswell, and he wrote the book in 1939. So here comes the book. It's not that long. And we'll see some pictures along with it. So the book begins Once upon a time, oh, many years ago, as time is calculated by men, but which was only yesterday in the celestial calendar of heaven, there was in paradise a most miserable, thoroughly unhappily, and utterly dejected cherub who was known throughout the heaven as the littlest angel. He was exactly four years, six months, five days, seven hours, and 42 minutes of age when he presented himself to the venerable gatekeeper and waited for admittance to the glorious kingdom of God. Standing defiantly, the littlest angel tried to pretend that he wasn't at all impressed by such unearthly splendor, and that he wasn't at all afraid. But his lower lip trembled, and a tear disgraced him by making a new furrow down his already tear-streaked face, coming to a precipitous halt at the very tip of his small, freckled nose. But that wasn't all. While the kindly gatekeeper was entering the name in his great book, The Littlest Angel, having left home, as usual, without a handkerchief, endeavored to hide the telltale evidence by snuffing, a most unangelic sound, which so unnerved the good gatekeeper that he did something he had never done before in all eternity. He blotted the page. From that moment on, the heavenly peace was never quite the same and the littlest angel soon became the despair of all heavenly hosts. His shrill, ear-splitting whistle resounded at all hours through the golden streets. It startled the patriarch prophets and disturbed their meditation. Yes, and on top of that, he inevitably sang off-key at the singing practice of the heavenly choir, spoiling its earthly effects. And, being so small, it seemed to take him twice as long as anyone else to get to nightly prayers. The littlest angel always arrived late and always knocked everyone's wing askew as he darted into his place. Although these flaws in his behavior might have been overlooked, the general appearance of the littlest angel was even more disreputable than his deportment. It was first whispered among the seraphim and cherubim and said aloud among the angels and archangels that he didn't even look like an angel. And they were quite correct. He didn't. His halo was permanently tarnished where he held on to it with one hot little chubby hand when he ran and he was always running. Furthermore, even when he stood very still it never behaved as a halo should. It was always slipping down over his right eye or his left eye or else just for pure meanness slipping off the back of his head and rolling away down some golden street just so he'd have to chase after it. Yes, it might be here recorded that his wings were neither useful nor ornamental all paradise held its breath when the littlest angel perched himself like an unhappy fledgling sparrow 
on the very edge of a gilded cloud and prepare to take off. He would teeter this way and that way, and after much coaxing and a few false starts, he would shut both of his eyes, hold his freckled nose, count up to 303, then hurl himself slowly into space. However, owing to the regrettable fact that he was always forgot to move his wings, the littlest angel always fell head over halo. It was also reported and never denied that when he was nervous, which was most of the time, he bit his wingtips. Now anyone can easily understand why the littlest angel would, sooner or later, have to be disciplined. And so, on an eternal day of an eternal month, in the year eternal, he was directed to present his small self before the angel of peace. The littlest angel combed his hair, dusted his wings, and scrambled into his most clean garment, and then, with a heavy heart, trudged his way to the place of judgment. He tried to postpone the dreaded ordeal by loitering along the streets of the guardian angels, pausing a few timeless moments to minutely inspect the long list of new arrivals. Although all heaven knew that he couldn't read a word, and he idled more than several immortal moments to carefully examine a display of harps, although everyone in the celestial city knew that he couldn't play a note. But at length and at last, he slowly approached a doorway, which was surmounted by a pair of golden scales, signifying that heavenly justice was dispensed within. To the littlest angel's great surprise, he heard a merry voice singing. The littlest angel removed his halo, breathed upon it heavily, then polished it upon his robe, a procedure which added nothing to his already untidy appearance. Then he tiptoed in. The singer, who was known as the understanding angel, looked down at the small culprit, and the littlest angel instantly tried to make himself invisible by ingenious process of withdrawing his head into his robe, very much like a snapping turtle. At that, the singer laughed a jolly, heartwarming sound and said, Oh, you're the one who's been making heaven so unheavenly. Come here, cherub, and tell me all about it. The littlest angel ventured with a furtive look, first one eye, then the other. Suddenly, almost before he knew it, he was standing close to the understanding angel and was explaining how difficult it was for a boy who suddenly finds himself transformed into an angel. Yes, and no matter what the archangels said, he only swung once. Well, twice. All right, then. He swung three times on the golden gates, but that was just for something to do. That was the whole trouble. There wasn't anything for a small angel to do, and he was very homesick. Oh, not that paradise wasn't beautiful, but earth was beautiful too. Wasn't it created by God himself? Why, there were trees to climb, brooks to fish, caves to play at pirate chief, the swimming hole, the sun, rain, and dark, and dawn, and the thick brown dust so soft and warm beneath your feet. The understanding angel smiled, and his eyes a long-forgotten memory of another small boy from long ago. Then he asked the littlest angel what would make him most happy in paradise. The cherub thought for a moment and whispered in his ear, There was a box. I left it under my bed back home. If only I could have that. The understanding angel nodded his head. You shall have it he promised, and a fleet-winged heavenly messenger was instantly dispatched 
to bring the box to paradise. And then, in all those timeless days that followed, everyone wondered at the great change in the littlest angel. For among all the cherubs in God's kingdom, he was the most happy. His conduct was above the slightest reproach. His appearance was all that most fastidious could wish for. And on excursions to the Alliston fields, it could be said, and truly said, he flew like an angel. Then it came to pass that Jesus, Son of God, was to be born to Mary in Bethlehem, in Judea. And the glorious tidings spread throughout paradise. All the angels rejoiced, and their voices were lifted to herald the miracle of miracles, the coming of the Christ child. The angels and archangels, the cherubim and seraphim, the gatekeeper, the wingmaker, yes, and even the halo smith, put aside their usual task to prepare their gifts for the blessed infant all but the littlest angel. He sat himself down on the topmost step of the golden stairs and anxiously waited for inspiration. What could he give that would be most acceptable to the Son of God? At one time, he dreamed of composing a lyric hymn of adoration, but the littlest angel was woefully wanting in musical talent. Then... He grew tremendously exciting over writing a prayer, a prayer that would live forever in the hearts of men because it would be the first prayer ever to be heard by the Christ child. But the littlest angel was lamentably lacking in literary skills. Oh, what could a small angel give that would please the holy infant? The time of the miracle was very close at hand when the littlest angel at last decided on his gift. Then, on that day of days, he proudly brought it from his hiding place behind a cloud and humbly, with downcast eyes, placed it before the throne of God. It was only a small, rough, unsightly box, but inside were all those wonderful things that even a child of God would treasure. A small, rough, unsightly box, lying among all those other glorious gifts from all the angels of paradise, gifts of such rare and radiant splendor and breathless beauty that heaven and all the universe were lighted by it, mere reflection of their glory. And when the littlest angel saw this, he suddenly knew that his gift to God's child was irrevocable. He devoutly wished he might reclaim his shabby disc. His was ugly. It was worthless. If only he could hide it away from the sight of God before it was even noticed. But it was too late. The hand of God moves slowly over all that bright array of shining gifts, then paused, then dropped, then came to rest on the lowly gift of the littlest angel. The littlest angel trembled as the box was opened, and there, before the eyes of God and all his heavenly host, was what he offered to the Christ child. And what was his gift to the blessed infant? Well, there was a butterfly with golden wings captured one bright summer day on the hills above Jerusalem and a bright blue egg from a bird's nest in the olive tree that stood to shade his mother's kitchen door. Yes, and two white stones found on a muddy riverbank where he and his friends had played like small brown beavers, and at the bottom of the box a limp 
tooth-marked leather strap, once worn by, as a collar by his mongrel dog, who had died as he had lived in absolute love and infinite devotion. The littlest angel wept hot, bitter tears, for now he knew that instead of honoring the Son of God, he had been most blasphemous. Why had he ever thought that the box was so wonderful? Why had he dreamed that such utterly useless things would be loved by the blessed infant? In frantic terror, he turned to run and hide from the divine wrath of the Heavenly Father, but he stumbled and fell, and with horrifying wail and a clattering of halo, rolled in a ball of misery to the very foot of the heavenly throne. There was an ominous and dreadful silence in the celestial city, a silence complete and undisturbed, save for the heartbroken song of the littlest angel. Then suddenly, the voice of God, like divine music, rose and swelled through paradise. And the voice of God spoke, saying, Of all the gifts of all the angels, I find that this small box pleases me the most. Its contents are of earth and of men, and my son is born to be king of both. These are the things my son, too, will know and love and cherish, then regretfully will leave behind him when his task is done. I accept this gift in the name of the child Jesus, born of Mary, this night in Bethlehem. There was a breathless pause. Then the rough, unsightly box of the littlest angel began to glow with a bright, unearthly light. Then the light became luminous flame, and the flame became radiant brilliance that blinded the eyes of all the angels. None but the littlest angel saw it rise from the place before the throne of God, and he and only he watched it arch away from heaven and shed its clear, white, beckoning light over a stable where a child was born. There it shone on that night of miracles, and its light was reflected down the centuries deep in the hearts of mankind. Yet earthly eyes, blinded too by its splendor, would never know that the lowliest gift of the littlest angel was what all men would call forever the shining star of Bethlehem. And that is the end of the book. I hope you enjoyed it.